asked Elise to open my message with that song because it is one of the most powerfully poignant songs uh, for me in my spiritual walk over, over the years of, of my Christian faith. That song was written by an artist named Keith Green in 1978. So it was a part of my Christian life um, for really the entirety of my Christian faith. Almost every time I hear it, it brings tears to my eyes. And I think the reason it is so poignant for me is because it captures an experience I encounter consistently throughout my Christian walk, something that I come back to over and over and over again. My eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold. And I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. What can be done for an old heart like mine? Nearly 50 years of being a Christ follower, and there have been seasons, I mean countless seasons, over that time where I find myself feeling that very way. God, I know how I, how I ought to be, but it all feels so dry, it feels so hard, it feels so cold. I bring this up as, as a reflection for us today because today begins our fervent week of prayer. It's a week that we as a congregation, we as a church have set aside to focus specifically on our prayer lives. Um, we're starting today with a message on, on prayer throughout the week. We've got reminders and, and, and challenges in our prayer life daily. Um, we gather on Wednesday. We're coming, we have a prayer event on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And then we culminate on next Sunday with, with a specific prayer service, and then we have the um, gathering in the evening. It's a time when we as a church, when, when we as pastors, when we as leaders, ask us as members of this congregation to turn our hearts towards an action, an attitude, a life of prayer. And I really believe that for many of us, it, it is hard to enter into a season of prayer. Because for many of us, what it does, it causes us to have a sense of failure, a sense of, of falling short. Because many of us find ourselves exactly where that's at. My heart is hard. My prayers seem cold. It feels like I'm just kind of going through the motions, and I've got to kind of figure out a way to feel a part of this. When it seems like everybody else around me seems to get it. The truth is many of us have to step into these places and try and figure it out. One of the reasons that this song has been such an inspiration for me is not simply because it captures my sense of failure, the sense of coldness that I have experienced. It is an inspiration because I think it subtly brings to the forefront, it brings to my mind the way we can find release from the cold prison of our indifference. What can be done for an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew with the wine of your blood. Now, on the surface, it might not seem like that helps much. But the incredible truth behind the, the profound words here can transform us if we understand the power of these truths. The application of the wine of the blood and the oil of his spirit. Let's take the first one. The wine of his blood. For any quick Christian, we would understand this application because we've probably heard it over and over again. What's the reference here? After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
which is poured out for you. What is the wine of his blood? The declaration here is a representation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our salvation. That Jesus Christ in this is saying, I am pouring out my blood for you. This is a covenant that is made in the shedding of my blood for the remission of your sins to open a way for you to be renewed, to be cleansed, to come into relationship with your heavenly Father, to, to, to continually walk with me and to know me, to have the Spirit alive in you. The declaration here is that the, the wine of the blood represents everything that our salvation actually means. Why is that so important? Why do I feel like appealing to the application of the wine of the blood is so powerful in waking us up to the vibrancy of our prayer life? I want you to listen to this quote about prayer and see if you can see why the wine of the blood expressed on the cross is key. Prayerlessness is not fundamentally a discipline problem. At root, it's a faith problem. Prayer is the native language of faith. John Calvin called the prayer, called prayer the, the chief exercise of faith. That is why when faith is awake and surging in us, prayer doesn't feel like a burden or an obligation. It feels natural. It's how faith most instinctively speaks. Do you hear what it said there? How it started? Prayer is not fundamentally a discipline problem. And, and I think that's an important thing for us to understand as we step into trying to live out a life of prayer. For many of us, we often believe that our failure is, is a lack of discipline, that if we, just, if, if we could just concentrate better, if we, could just, if we could just put it on our calendar more, if we could just make sure that we set that time aside. And yet, for many of us, even when we do that, we step into those moments of discipline and our mind still begins to wander and, our mind still, and, and prayer still becomes this thing that is, is more of a struggle. It's more of a fight. But we're looking at and we're thinking about prayer, I think, in a wrong way. Prayerlessness is not fundamentally a discipline problem. It's a faith problem. A good way to think about our prayer life is like a train. Faith is the engine that drives the train. And God's promises is the fuel that fires that engine. And this is why it ultimately is connected to the wine of the blood of Jesus Christ. Prayer is the train. Faith is the engine that drives the train, and the fuel that feeds that is the promises of God. And, and, and in this analogy, discipline ends up being the rails on which the, the, the prayer drives. So being able to set time aside and, and, and having that, the, that practical lived out is important. But ultimately what drives the train is the realization of the promises of God. And this is why, ultimately, I say that, that, understand, that looking at and, and reflecting on the, on the blood of Jesus Christ is important because it is in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ all the promises of God is fulfilled. Everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we experience is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. He shed his blood for us. Because of his sacrificial laying down, we have everything we need. Everything we have in Jesus Christ is because of that. There is not a single thing that we can look at, and a single thing that we, that we can rely on, not a single thing that, that we can have an expectation for in our Christian faith that isn't there because of what Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, did on the cross. Everything is undergirded in our life in Christ by the shedding of Christ's blood. If you doubt that, I want you to listen. Hebrews 19 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
The blood of Jesus Christ allows our dead works to be washed away so we can even serve our living God. Ephesians 1 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. The, 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 the manifest, the, 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 the majesty of his mercy and grace is shown through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 says, Now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All of our reconciliation, one to another, all of our reconciliation with our Heavenly Father is the result of the blood of Jesus Christ. First John says, it, but if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And how about 1 Peter chapter 2? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we are healed. The core of our faith is rooted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that gave us forgiveness of sins, gave us access to the Father, gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, gave us the assurance of his presence, the healing of our body and soul, the hope of a better tomorrow and the promise of eternal life. All is because of what Jesus Christ did by shedding his blood for us. The promise of his, of his being with us always the abiding of his Holy Spirit, everything, his love for us was manifested. The gift of the blood of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. Prayerlessness is not fundamentally a discipline problem. At root, it's a faith problem. When we find ourselves in a place of prayerlessness, we are in a place of faith, we are in a place of faithlessness. And the place that our faith is restored is where we renew the truth of the covenant we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. It really is an incredibly um, clearly connected idea. If we do not believe Jesus Christ loves us, we will, we, will, we will struggle in our prayer life. If we do not believe that Jesus Christ cares about us, we will struggle in our prayer life. If we do not believe that Jesus Christ is sovereign and, and, and Lord over all things, we will struggle in our prayer life. And it is coming to the cross and realizing he gave himself for you so that all of this might be realized in you, that your faith rises. And you come to a place in which you go, I know your love for me. I know your authority. I know your power. Because you showed it on the cross. I can tell you in my life, when I have found myself with dry eyes and hard heart and cold prayers, it's usually because life and circumstances and my own sin and indifference has taken me from the profound faith that the gift of Christ's shed blood affords me so much. I forget how he deeply loved me and gave himself for me, how he covered my sins and washed me clean and made me his child and purchased my healing. Instinctively throughout the years now, I, I draw near to the foot of, of the cross. I contemplate his death, his sacrifice, and it becomes the starting point of my renewal. If you are struggling Know that it's not because of a lack of self-discipline. It is because of a lack of faith. Draw nearer to the truth of his love and his sacrifice and his provision and his promises. And feel the truth begin to take hold of your life. The second profoundly important truth revealed in the song that captures my heart alongside the application of, of the wine of the blood is the application of the oil of his spirit. As with the first point, the theological implications uh, are much deeper than, than at first blush. In the Old Testament, the act of anointing with oil was originally restricted 
to priests and, and instruments of worship, and then was eventually uh, expanded to, um, to kings. Um, the imagery of, of the anointing when, when, when the priest would come or when the prophet would come with a horn of oil and pour it over the one who was be, to be anointed or the instrument that was to be used for the purposes of God was to convey that, 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 the, that the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, was on those who were specifically chosen for his use. We see this expressed in, in, in Samuel chapter 16 where it records the choosing of David for the kingship of Israel where it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. It, 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 it's also illustrated in the prophetic statement about Jesus found in Isaiah chapter 61 where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon him because the Lord has anointed him to bring news, good news, to the poor. And we see this idea being transferred to the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers in the new covenant as we are the anointed. We are the anointed as described by 1 Peter in chapter 2 where he declares us the royal priesthood. There's something very specific about, about that, that, that phrase that he uses where he says he, he's using the idea of the kingship and the priesthood, both of which are anointed by oil and anointed by the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that's who we are. But it's more specific in 1 John 2, where in verse 20 he says, you have been anointed by the Holy One. The declaration there is, you have been anointed by Jesus Christ. And it becomes clear here that the, that the Holy One, Jesus, anoints us with the Holy Spirit. When he says, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. We see that as a very clear allusion to the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come to what? Lead us into all truth. To teach us. To be the one that shows us who Christ is. So the, the declaration here is that Jesus Christ, the Holy One, has anointed you with the Holy Spirit. All that I'm saying this to say that the declaration of the oil of the Spirit is the abiding presence of God in our lives. And to say that it is the Holy Spirit in a li alive in our lives that will animate your prayer life. If we are prayerless, it is not because of a lack of self-discipline, but I would argue a lack of submission to the Holy Spirit that manifests itself in different ways in our lives. That for many of us, this lack of submission, this lack of submission to the Holy Spirit is manifested by us in, in different ways that prevent us from being able to step into this place of having a vibrant life of prayer. The Bible itself is clear about the power of praying in the Spirit, having the Spirit of God animating your prayer life. When you look at Ephesians chapter 6, you see this encouragement wrapped in the description of the whole armor of God. And, and I think this is important for us to understand it within, it, within its context. When, we go to, when you go to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 is that, that famous chapter that talks about putting on the whole armor of God, that you're stepping into the spiritual fight, you're stepping into the spiritual battle, and, and you're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. And as, 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 as Paul writes there, he talks about, about the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, right? That we're entering into the spiritual battle, and he's saying, you put on these things to, to, to be on the offensive and to, and to be able to defend yourself against the attacks of the enemy. But then it says in the middle of that, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and then what does it say? Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So the implication here of Paul in Ephesians is, is, that, is that to live victoriously, we have to pray, and not just pray, but pray in the Spirit. 
So what does that mean? What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Well, it means quite a few different things, but the first thing we know it doesn't mean is to pray in the flesh. Prayer in the power of the flesh relies upon human ability and human effort to carry the prayer forward. I really like what Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was an evangelist and pastor, um, wrote in a book putting this, I think, in proper perspective. He said, we all know what it is to feel deadness in prayer, difficulty in prayer, to be tongue-tied with nothing to say, as it were, having to force ourselves to try. Well, to the extent that is true of us, we are not praying in the Spirit. So what I want you to understand from that is this. When we are struggling to pray, realize we are in a flesh struggle in that place. So, so that needs to, to, to turn to us to examine our own hearts and ask ourselves, where are we at with the Holy Spirit in our lives? And again, that, that can mean quite a few things. But there are two important ones that I want us to mention and I want us to focus in on this morning and that I want us to contemplate this morning. But before we get into the specifics of that, I want you to know what we mean when I'm saying we, we are praying in the Spirit. In the flesh, we are pushing prayers forward. While in the Spirit, we, we feel caught up in the way the Spirit carries the prayer forward. Praying in the Spirit is experiencing the Spirit of life bringing prayer to life. Praying in the Spirit means that the Spirit empowers the prayer and carries it to the Father in the name of Jesus. That the prayer itself has a living quality characterized by, by warmth and freedom and a sense of exchange. This is what our prayer life should be like. Not the struggle. Not the fight. Not the, not, not the work to kind of, kind of capture our minds, but out of faith, in belief in Jesus Christ, in a dependency upon the Holy Spirit, he moves us forward in our prayer life. So why does that, for many of us, not cat, uh, characterize what our prayer life is like? Well, I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we walking in the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit, or are you, are you occasionally attempting to park in the Spirit? This is what a lot of our Christian faith is like, right? We, 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 we carve out these moments, we carve out these times, and we're like, this is when I'm going to be spiritual. I, I, I set aside 20 minutes for prayer, and then this is where I'm going to try and enter in. Or maybe times when we come to church, this is when we're going to be spiritual. We're going to give time to the Spirit. But the, the declaration here is that we walk in the Spirit, that our lives are continually and constantly in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit is necessitated by walking in the Spirit. And ultimately what that means is we have to examine our lives when we realize our eyes are dry and our heart is hard and our prayers are cold. We have to look at ourselves. And this is why the practice of repentance is so closely tied to the life of prayer. What does walking in the Spirit look like? I want you to look at where it's explained in Galatians 5 and see how it becomes evident, how it interferes in our prayer life if we're not walking in the Spirit. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those, these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live 
by the Spirit, let us also keep step in the Spirit. So what is the clear implication here? When we allow sin to manifest in our lives, we are not walking in the Spirit. We are not living by the Spirit. We are not yielded to the Spirit. So when we come to a point of prayer, it is, it is reasonable that we will struggle to pray in the Spirit. One of the things that gets in the way of having that animated, that, that living, that vibrant life of prayer is the truth that we have sin in our lives that have separated us from this communion with the Holy Spirit. It's like I said earlier, it's why it is entirely appropriate that as we embark on a, on a week of prayer, as we embark on, on, on a season of prayer and a time of prayer, that we begin it with a reflection on our hearts and on our minds and on our spirits and on our lives and, and initiate it with a sense of repentance. The examination of our hearts, the scrutinizing of our lives and the repenting of our sins is incredibly appropriate and it is incredibly productive when you look at your life and you say, my prayers seem cold. Don't let sin get in the way of his presence. Lay it down and in that you can pick up the power of his spirit in your prayer life. And, and I think it's really like valuable to go back and look at the list that we see that Paul laid out there. It's really broad, isn't it? It, it touches on so many things. It's not just simply these, the, the, these deep and dark sins that, that we may be harboring or we may be participating in. It, it's things like enmity and strife and jealousy and, and anger and rivalries, dissensions and divisions. If we do not confront these in our hearts and our minds, we are not walking in the Spirit. And it is reasonable to assume we will not pray in the Spirit, but struggle to pray in the flesh. And I think the second question that I want us to answer and ask, ask and answer ourselves this morning is, are we quenching the Spirit in our lives? Are we walking in the Spirit that, that sets free the praying in the Spirit. But are we quenching the Spirit as we enter into times like this? First, First Thessalonians 5 ties the idea of quenching the Spirit closely to the call to praying without ceasing. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything and hold fast to what is good. He says in this place, in this context, he says, listen, as you're, as you're praying without ceasing, do not quench the spirit alive in you. And, and it's interesting to me, too, that, that he then makes a declaration, do not despise prophecies. What he's doing is he's asking us whether or not our hearts are positioned in a way that we are receptive and open to the move of the Holy Spirit in our midst in the ways in which he desires to speak, in the ways in which he desires to do what he desires to do. Many of us in our lives quench the Spirit. And we quench the Spirit from a couple different, a couple different ways. First and foremost, for many of us, we quench the Spirit because we are chosen to be ignorant of the Spirit. We, 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 want, the, we want a very neat little Christian faith, and, and so we just don't really worry about the things that might be out there that are a little bit beyond ourselves. And so we stay within our box and we don't allow the Spirit of God free reign in our lives because we don't want to explore that. We don't want to go into that place. We want to remain ignorant. For, for many of us, we quench the Spirit because it, it asks of us things that are beyond our comfort zone. It, it, it asks, of us, asks of us actions and, and, and responses and, 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 and to behave in ways that might be beyond what we're comfortable with. And, and this, can, this can take lots of different forms. It can be the Holy Spirit speaking to us to go talk to somebody. It can be the Holy Spirit speaking to us and asking us to step forward and do something. Or it can be us resisting the manifestation of the Spirit in different ways in our midst. It's interesting to me because because when he says this, 
he, he expresses specifically that idea of, of, of not despising prophecy. So many people are sitting here going, well, I don't know that the Holy Spirit speaks that way. Well, if we restrict the way the Holy Spirit might speak, can you see how it might affect our life of prayer? What does it mean to quench the Spirit? The Amplified Bible states this verse by saying, do not quench, suppress, or subdue the Holy Spirit. The New Living Translation says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. And I love the way the Phillips Translation says it because it says, never damp the fire of the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit requires giving the Holy Spirit full course, full authority, and full influence. As I say, we tend to, to, to quench the Spirit through the repression of, of spiritual influence. The, the Bible clearly states that the gift of the Holy Spirit brings to, light, to the life of the believer and to the life of the church gifts that manifest themselves for our spiritual benefit. The Spirit is meant to speak to your heart, to speak to your life, to speak to the church and bring words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of truth, of prophecy, to bring messages in tongues and interpretation, to manifest his power in healings and miracles. And we have to lay down our hesitancy and our resistance, or we will not see the Holy Spirit carry us along in our prayer life. Ultimately, it's not hard. It's just yield. Yield to the Spirit. Set aside your own plans. Set aside your own proclivities. Set aside what you think things should be. Say, Holy Spirit, I just want to pray in your Spirit. Whatever you have for me, whatever you want to do in my midst, whatever you want to say, speak through me. Give me your ideas. Give me your thoughts. I'm yielded completely to you. Are you quenching the Spirit in your spirit life? Are you at a place in your life in which you're not fully yielded to what he has? Is your life and life choices preventing from you from walking in the Spirit to living in the Spirit? So much of that will get in the way of a Spirit-led life of prayer. If you're entering into this time of prayer fearfully, fearful that your eyes are dry, that your heart is hard, that your faith is old, and your prayers are cold, be revived this morning by the wine of his blood and the oil of his spirit. Take this time and reflect on what Christ death on the cross, what his blood purchased for you. He is, he showed himself sovereign, all-powerful in the sacrifice he gave. So you can go to him in prayer. He showed himself loving, gracious, having a heart for you in the shedding of his blood. You can go to him by faith, knowing he loves you. Knowing that you've been cleansed, knowing that your sin has been washed away, that he is not going to resist you, that he's not going to push you away, but he's going to draw you near to him. Have the faith that Christ shed blood gives you to enter into his presence. And when you're in his presence, Make sure that your life is governed and led and walk in the Spirit. Lay down any sin that separates you. Repent. It is such a beautiful part of the Christian experience. Repent. Step into his presence and then give him full reign to do whatever it is he wants to do. This is the beauty of the prayer life of a believer. And we can have it. And you can have it. Just allow him to do this in your life.